Yeah, all right. Uh, thank you. So uh, my name is Iris Freitas, and I'm standing here on behalf of my co-coordinators, uh, Fukuko Yuasa from KEK and Stephen Jones from Munich. And uh, I'm supposed to summarize track three, uh, which, as this picture shows, is the smallest track. Uh, but um, you can also see it's at the top. <laughs> And I think it's a little bit different than the other two tracks because it's dominated by theoretical physicists. And, um, well, I mean, one news that you might appreciate here is do use computers, uh, but they want to be in the driver's seat. So basically, we as theorists want to understand what the computer is doing, and only then uh, are we willing to believe the outcome. Um, so as a, uh, because of that, you know, more advanced computing techniques might be adopted a little bit more slowly in the theory community. On the other hand, we also have to recognize while we feel we are in the driver's seat, we have to move where everybody else is moving because uh, we cannot necessarily move on our own. Um, on the other hand, uh, it is true theorists use computers and computers help. And sometimes the microphones stop working. Okay, uh, <clears throat> but uh, nevertheless, um, real progress is only oftentimes being made if you uh, put insightful creative ideas together with the computing. And we had a number of examples uh, in this track that show this. Let me start out, for instance, by a presentation by uh, Ben Raul, who uh, was talking about a massive five loop calculation that he and his collaborators performed. And it turned out they had an enormous number of terms that even on you know, a powerful computer cluster would not be able to be processed. Uh, but just by rewriting one vertex, which normally is written in this way, in a different way, they were able to reduce the number of crucial terms for the algorithm by many orders of magnitude. And that made the calculation possible. Um, Another example of where creative ideas are important, but actually quite different in nature, by uh, Stefano Laporta. You have seen uh, his talk in the plenary session, but he gave more details in track three, showing uh, how he was able to uh, obtain an analytical result uh, for a complicated loop calculation by first doing a high precision numerical calculation and then having some smart ideas about well, what kind of building blocks could I actually have, possibly, that describe this result analytically? And, you know, which, what has tons of digits numerically can then be summarized in this neat little formula down here. Uh, also, smart ideas are actually important for the numerical calculations itself. Uh, so this is a slide from a presentation by Elise de Donker, who was talking about... Um, methods for numerical integration. And uh, I guess all of you know, you know, the Vegas routine for Monte Carlo integration that many of us use. It's nice in general, but it's sometimes not at all the most efficient one. There are actually also so-called quasi Monte Carlo routines, which actually use a regular lattice grid. It's not aligned with the variables that you're using, but it's nevertheless regular. And in, uh, in a number of cases, that's way more efficient to yield uh, um, a result in a reasonable amount of time. So here's an example for a certain loop uh, integral that was computed directly, just directly computing uh, the integral over the Feynman parameters with some uh, 100 million points. And within a time of seconds, um, she was able to obtain a precision of 14 digits, which I think is quite impressive. This was on a GPU, but nevertheless. This is impressive. Um, here's an example, actually, which reaches out into the experimental community. This is about simulating um, uh, trajectories of particles uh, in, in a detector simulation, like with Jean. And what's normally being done is you basically go in steps, right? So you have a particle going from here to there. Uh, you first look at this step, you know, make a first guess how it's moving. Then you realize, okay, there's a volume transition in between, so you need to be a bit more accurate. So you subdivide the step into two pieces, and you keep going until you reach the precision that you need. 
Uh, however, this can be compu computationally be quite intensive, especially if you have many different um, units, segments, and so on in your detector. And uh, it was found basically that you can improve on this quite substantially. Instead of putting these uh, time steps, you instead, you know, consider a set of trajectories, exact trajectories, that go from here to there. And then you basically just um, pick out the trajectory that you need in for the given initial momentum that you have. And uh, so if you have, you know, a complex detector, there's actually a performance increase from that. Uh, finally, uh, moving into something that's really more uh, using advanced computing techniques that kind of do their own thing, but nevertheless, again, um, human ideas are important for increasing efficiency. This is an example from astrophysics. Uh, so in astrophysics, you often have the situation that you observe um, a number of reference objects, galaxies, stars, whatever you're interested in, and you have good precise measurements about them. You train a neural network on them, and then you try to make uh, predictions for the properties of other objects that you observed with less data because there was not enough observation time or something like that. But oftentimes, this um, uh, prediction for other groups of objects is uh, on shaky ground because these may be fainter objects. That's why your data is not as accurate. And you don't know exactly if those fainter objects, being far away, uh, behave in the same way as the training sample that you have. Uh, and the neural network, of course, will just, you know, barrel ahead and not tell you. But it turns out there's a, there's a way to deal with that problem called active learning. The neural network basically can tell you when you uh, reach um, elements of your sample that may be sufficiently different from your training sample so that the neural network is not 100% sure if it had enough training information. So it will tell you basically these are uncertain cases and then you can go back and you know you can try to look at it yourself or try to gather more data on these examples and improve on. So these were examples basically where um, important uh, human provided ideas are uh, relevant for actually making uh, full use of the computing uh, possibilities that we have. Uh, in addition, uh, we can also use computers basically to make our work more convenient in order to make uh, work of some people more accessible for other people. And we had some examples of that kind. For example, this is uh, a slide from a talk by Hiren Patel, who is uh, providing the package X, which runs on Mathematica. And so this is a tool that does analytical and algebraic calculations of Feynman integrals. But he actually provided also a link to an external library by other people. This external library is called Collier, which does numerical evaluations of uh, basic functions that you need for Feynman integrals. And uh, this is done in a way that basically, as a user, you don't have to worry about every, anything. You just call a mathematical command. What happens is this command uh, produce a C code, that C code is linked with this library, it's compiled in the background, it uh, computes the result, it comes back to Mathematica, and you know, you just get a nice result at Mathematica, but uh, with, a, with a speed of a C program. Um, now, you can even be more ambitious and basically say, well, this, is, this was an effort to basically join two different programming languages, Mathematica, which is nice to do, to, to program in, and C, which is fast. Uh, but it would be great if we had a language that can do both of those things at the same time. And Sebastian Binet tried to convince us that there is such a language called Go. So this is a language that has the feel of an interpreter language like Mathematica or Python, but it's actually a compiled language, so it's also fast. And uh, he has uh, endeavored to write a whole range of tools in this language, they go under the uh, library name GoHap. So you can look at them, you can use them for analysis, for simulation, for uh, various kinds of uh, procedures that you need to do, and um, seems to be really easy to learn. So besides contributed talks, we also had um, on Thursday a panel discussion, which was focused on the fact that um, by and large, one can say doing leading order simulations next to leading order simulations for LHC is a solved problem. There are tools 
that do that in a uh, almost general way. I mean, you can always find issues where it breaks down, but by and large it does it. But um, the forefront of theoretical calculations is basically next to next to leading order or higher. So two, three loop and so forth. And uh, basically this discussion was about issues we are facing and uh, how we can get around them. Uh, so we had four panelists, Walter Rehle, uh, Stephen Jones, Kiyoshi Kato, and Takahiro Ueda, who gave different perspectives. And um, of course, members in the audience discussed too, and there were three main teams, I think, that came out of this discussion. One was um, these calculations at uh, the forefront tend to have be numerically rather expensive. Uh, and uh, what basically needs to control that. Of course, we have more numerical capabilities with clusters and GPUs and so forth, but nevertheless, um, it can spiral out of control if you don't pay attention. And then second, what's really important, everybody, of course, uses computers for doing their calculation, but oftentimes just the results get published in a paper, uh, and the software that was kind of homemade to do that uh, is not available to the public which makes it really hard to check uh, some of these results in the future. So big appeal, try to do the best, even if you don't make like a fully documented public version, try to do the best to somehow get your software out there. And finally, um, um, loop calculators are an important building blocks for making uh, predictions for experimental results, uh, but often these tools themselves do not make the final phenomenological result. They need to inter be interfaced with say the event generator or something else. So um, we probably need some standard for doing that interface. And we did also have some talks that actually address all of these aspects. So for the numerical expensive computations, for instance, you could try to use specialized hardware for speeding them up. And there was a contribution by Hiroshi Daisaka where he used FPGAs, uh, which were specifically programmed to base divisions, additions, of floating point numbers, and in fact they were set up to do that in quadruple, hexaple, and even octuple precision, something you don't get from a CPU in a reasonable um, amount of time. And as a result of that, they were able to do uh, very high dimensional integrals much faster. For instance, integrals that appear in three and four loop calculations, which were uh, also presented in a parallel talk by Kiyoshi Kato. Um, then in addition, besides loops, you actually also always need to compute real radiation contributions. They are necessary because that's a realistic picture, but also to cancel divergencies. And oftentimes they could con uh, uh, consume more computational time than the loops themselves. But there are ways to improve that. One was shown by Zhao Liu uh, on Monday, where basically um, in the regions where you really spend a lot of time where particles become soft and collinear, you can actually analytically compute uh, some of those terms where the computer spends a lot of time about. Uh, as a result, um, the cutoff where you need to go to can be increased much higher. So this is without the extra analytical contributions. This is with the extra analytical contributions. You see even with a high cut, you already get a very good result and can save a lot of computing time. About um, being programs being available to the public. We also had several contributions that emphasized ways to do that. For instance, in a contribution by Stephen Jones on PySecDEC, which is a new version of an earlier program called SecDEC, but it's entirely open source and also uses only open source building blocks from other sources. So this is for doing multi-loop calculations. In addition, there's an effort by several authors, which was presented by Thomas Hahn, to actually make a database for loop calculations. Because oftentimes, uh, this is more like for the theorists themselves, but oftentimes we have the problem, we do some calculation, and you know, we have some feeling, you know, some of those special cases that I'm looking at maybe already somewhere in the literature, but how am I gonna find them if I don't know who the authors are? Uh, this database, instead, you won't search for authors, but you just enter the geometry of the diagram you're interested in, and it will spit you out everything that it has in the database, and it will give you the references to the papers. Of course, once it's fully supplied, right now it's not complete. And then finally, um, about the last aspect of needing a standard for interfacing loop calculations to, uh, say, event generators, Daniel Metre was advocating that maybe one can use entuple files for that, 
that actually has been done in some instances, it becomes more complicated if you really want to go to next to next to leading order or maybe beyond. Uh, in particular, if you want to put all the information in the entuples that you might want to have, they become huge files, which may be very cumbersome. In addition, they also require more effort for the programming. But you can actually get potentially already a workable result by, by dropping some of the information and just um, uh, inferring that uh, indirectly afterwards. So finally, uh, I'm kind of out of time, but um, I, I cannot mention all examples anyways, but I mean, there were all also some cases of more formal physics. Andrei Davidichev um, described how one can use geometry for getting a deeper understanding of loop integrals and for the first time get a uh, result for a four-point loop integral for arbitrary dimension. Now, we live in four dimensions, but there may be examples where this is actually an important building block. And Carlos in Trosa was talking about um, finding relations between um, different symmetries, different Lie algebras. Uh, this is also important from a theoretical point of view, but becomes really difficult if the order of the symmetry group becomes really large, because then there are you know, a gazillion terms that you have to consider. But a computer is actually good at doing that. So I apologize for the contributions that I was not able to mention here. So this is, I just handpicked a number of contributions to give you some ideas. So I encourage you to look at the slides on Indico and thank you for your attention.